All right. It still works. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to what promises to be an exciting lecture by one of our very own GSAP professors tonight, Juan Herreros. You may know Juan as a professor of practice here at the school and certainly one of our most popular studio teachers. This year, he's also the new director of the Advanced Studios and the curator of the Transfer Dialogues, a series of conversations which are drawing together the many themes and perspectives emerging from the third year studios with the intent of capturing the pulse of the school live. But Juan is not entirely ours. <laughs> he is also the chair professor at the School of Architecture of Madrid, has a full-blown, highly successful architectural practice in Spain, and is working all over the world. In many ways, Juan's multifaceted and multi-situated practice is redefining the model of what a global practitioner of architecture can be in the 21st century, and has contributed for some time now to his standing as one of the most well-known Spanish architects practicing today. If this semester's Wednesday evening lecture series is opening up the notion of what a body of work is, it is also tying this notion not only to process, but more particularly to our contemporary ways of working, ways of being and operating, which have allowed small offices to become quite competitive in the in an international arena due to attributes such as lightness and flexibility, a nomadic spirit and a particular sensibility. Here again, any preconceived idea about scale of practice relative to either output or importance is undermined with almost the suggestion that sometimes scale can be inversely proportional to influence. This ways of working also implies an expanded notion of what an architect is or can be. In every architect, Juan believes there is a collection of different architects. The architect as designer of prototypes, the architect as DJ, mixing large groups of experts and collaborators, the dialogue architect who has to confront his or her proposals with different audiences and op opinion leaders, the architect as a catalyst for social and environmental transformations, or the architect as editor, selector, and synthesizer of information able to render complexity clear. And yet, Juan's ability to move from one role to the other while still being deeply engaged with building has allowed his work to carry itself throughout scales, types, and sites with the same level of freshness and elegance. From the early pavilions, such as the Cobo residence in Mallorca, the Gordillo study for a painter in Madrid, or my most favorite, the gymnasium in a historic park also in Madrid, and all designed in partnership with Iñaki Abalos, to the seminal Madrid recycling plant, which recasts the relationship between architecture and infrastructure in ways that still resonate around the globe, Juan's projects and buildings have become a model for how to, quoting from his book Recycling Madrid, endow a project with public and political content, making visible something that had always been hidden. This desire to make the visible to make the invisible visible has transpired throughout Juan's work, not only through his buildings and teaching, but also through his research and publishing, with one of the most important books of the past decade being Tower and Office, From Modernist Theory to Contemporary Practice. As an instant classic that re-examines the typology of the office, it reclaimed a much needed new space for the generic and in contrast to our addiction to spectacle. The invisible and the generic could also be understood as the day in the life of an architect, where Juan's most recent, most recent research has turned to in an attempt to redefine contemporary architectural practice in dialogue with other disciplines, an investigation most clearly evident in his project called Dialogue Architecture. Initiated as part of the 2012 Venice Biennale and exhibited in Oslo, Madrid, Mexico, and Studio X Rio, this itinerant Itinerant project is a collection of architectural forms, construction details, and organizational charts that focus on the collaborative processes between architects, clients, and consultants that are enacted with every project. This dialogue format is, I suspect, very much behind the dialogue transfer idea we are experimenting with this semester. 
as if there were more than 24 hours in a day. And as I noted earlier, Juan is also building everywhere and with a growing body of work, which continues to carry the early investigations. Now at a different scale and within varied contexts, his current projects include the Munch Museum in the Monk Museum in Oslo, the International Conference Center of Bogota, the Euromed Project in Marseille, the ANFA District in Casablanca, the Bank of Panama Headquarter, and the Communication Hut for the 2011 Guangzhou De Design Biennale in South Korea. And since 2010, I think the Avalos and Heroes Archive sits uh, at the Canadian Center for Architecture. So please join me very much and warmly in welcoming uh, Juan tonight. Thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. Thank you, Amal, for the presentation. Uh, it's really uh, strange to hear description of yourself, so high quality <laughs> <laughs> selection of the nice part. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with all my friends tonight. Um, so to start, I'd like to say, when I received the invitation for this lecture, uh, the first title I, I, I thought was this, Looping Forward. No? Looping, for, look, looping Forward <clears throat> is the idea that half of the wheel have to go back to, to get the wheel go ahead. No? So it means that we have to back constantly to the already done already done by ourselves, but already done also by all the architecture we have behind us to move forward. No? This is also, I think that Amal has explained better than me, better than I can do, how today it's impossible to move forward if we, without confronting our interests with the rest of the world, with the other disciplines, with the others, with people, with the experts, with the, our clients. And that's because, as has been announced, this lecture is about conversations and dialogues. And especially that conversations that architects have to attend to make um, their work every day. And how we we can transform this traditionally B side of the architect's work into a new uh, instrument of design. What I want to say is that traditionally the tasks of architects have been divided in two groups. The noble one is the intimate work in the design process in our moleskins or corners thinking in a very creative way. And the rest of the world, which is a collection of nightmares and confrontations with the ignorant and the insensitive world that are trying to get worst our wonderful ideas. So um, I think that from, I don't know, a few years ago, we are we are attending the arising of a new generation of offices, a new generation of architects who are being able of transforming this B side of the architectural practice into a strong instrument, instruments of design. So it's in this confrontation we are avoiding the idea of convincing the others of what we really want to do, listening and dialoguing. We can find something unpredictable that can really enrich our work. Um, one of the examples is this collection of small offices that are now being so competitive in the global practice because they have the flexibility enough, they have the ability enough to understand the uh, different contexts and identities. They can also display the 
um, ability to identify the small differences, something that perhaps the big elephants of the architectural practice can't do. They don't have time or they don't have resources to do that. So this arising of the middle size or the small size you know, offices, I think is quite important today and perhaps is the changing of the, of, the, of the times and the paradigm of the architectural practice. Um, I'm going to show you five different impure projects. Impure means that all of them have something that put far from the ideal commission because they have some difficult parts or some uh, lack of traditionally important elements of control, for example. And every of these five uh, projects um, will, I try to describe through, through these uh, images of different types of architects. I think all of we are many architects together uh, in, in, in our everyday uh, practice and sometimes they arise are more visible or at least I'll try to make them visible tonight. Um, this is the first case. Is the architect's prototype designer. No work in drawings. Uh, no work in drawings perhaps in, in the US practice is not, uh, it's not a provocation because working drawings are completely different here than uh, they are in Europe, especially in south of Europe, Spain, Portugal, Greece, you know, or South America, Latin America. We could say that uh, architects usually uh, do their own working drawings in the offices. We do for every project. Only in very special situations where when a very expert uh, knowledge is needed, like uh, complicated, uh, a complex facade, for example, somebody from out of the office could help us with the drawings. But the idea of no working drawings is related to uh, how sometimes we can't do the working drawings because we don't have the knowledge to do them or, or because it's not necessary to draw before, make, before making it. The idea of uh, the design, like the, the project, like something that is done today by projected into the future, is a beautiful description, but not always work well. This is a small house in, near Madrid. The owners of this house are very interesting uh, people. They really didn't want to Oh, oh. They really didn't want to have um, uh, these weekend houses that are like the redemption place where the uh, ugly city uh, is transformed in wonderful weekends uh, in contact with nature. So they were not very interested in that. Uh, they really wanted to have a very urban culture experience far from Madrid and they ask it not to grow the land, not to plant trees, no swimming pools, no basements, not touching the ground. They just wanted to go there and to inhabit something like the prolongation of the car that have take, has taken them from Madrid to this place. So the car is part of the house. No? Um, so the idea was, okay, let's do a kind of industrialized object who is landed here under the idea or the concept of the installation, like uh, art world considers this, this idea of site-specific site -specific installations. And, and for that, we prepare a few drawings with a not very well uh, defined, not too deep defined uh, construction uh, concept. And with uh, this collection, the only uh, traditional architectural activity we did was to plant these steel columns in the site. We eliminate the, the sand accumulated for years on, on, on these uh, stones. And during the winter, the water and the snow were cleaning and washing these stones, and in the spring we, we placed these columns to receive the house. That, while it was, um, we were planting these 
short columns to express this idea of not touching the ground. The house was built in a workshop out of Madrid, uh, a workshop not specialized in building houses. We are not, this project is not fascinated with the idea of building houses in factories. Every time architects have tried that, has, uh, have been a disaster. Um, this is one house, the one single house built in a, in a workshop and moved to the place. It was nice because for four months we were visiting this place every day and the project, the construction solutions and the construction systems were done, were made in real time with machines folding uh, the, the metals and cutting not necessarily drawing previously by them. You know? We were limited by the machines we had there and with the resources and couldn't complain about not having this or that size. So they were trying to answer our uh, necessities or our interests in the best way and all we could do is to correct in the, in the process uh, the details to build the house. That allowed us to have some uh, technological inputs in the project that they would have been impossible to do in the place where we are uh, working, where there is no water, no electricity, no, no. We are getting all of them from the ground or from the sun. So the house was built in these fragments. What's nice because in one moment you see there on the right the we, we test the assemblage of the different pieces and the 40 guys who have been working in the, in the production, they say, hey, it's a house. No? <laughs> <laughs> so we moved to the place and we planted there. The house stayed. with a beautiful attitude, no? <laughs> looking at the landscape and appreciating the landscape, showing clearly where to look at, where is the beauty, where is the beautiful part, and not trying to emulate, not trying to be integrated with the materials or with the colors or with the textures or even the shape. Uh, all of them are com completely contrary to the regulations about popular construction, so construction in this uh, kind of context in Spain. But we argued that it was like a big track. Stop it for a while here. So the house is there. And it's really representing this idea of uh, exploring new relations with nature which are not the relations of the fascination, are not the relations of the good and the bad uh, um, parts of the history. There are, it's, it's not expressing that the, the city always bad and the nature always good uh, division. The interior is completely industrialized and, and simple. And I have a video.
the house was installed in 12 hours from 8 in the morning to 8 in the night. <coughs> this is Spain, now it's the siesta time. <laughs> so, 11 hours. But the case study two is the architect of individual chapters, no total control. It's a, it's a kind of commission that I think have only 15 years ago would desperate architects when somebody called you and said, I, I only want you to do the facade. Oh, I, 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 I need you to do uh, the design of the volume of my building. So this is a collaboration with, uh, with an office uh, in Panama actually run it by an ex-Columbia <coughs> student, Ignacio Mayol. Um, and we were asked in this, in this commission to design a short tower, it's only 40 floors, uh, surrounded by hundreds of uh, super banal, huge towers, uh, with the condition that this small tower should have a kind of personality and represent uh, a kind of corporate image. You know? Um, the tower is called Banco Panama. It's not exactly the headquarters of the bank, the whole tower. The headquarters of the bank are only in a few floors of this building by that bank paid for the, also was the financial partner of the, of the construction. That gave, uh, gave us the idea that in this context uh, where uh, office buildings are uh, only um, big, huge skyscrapers, it's quite problematic for companies who need a small building to get a place to build it because in every uh, empty site you can, you can plant 800, uh, 80 floors. So uh, if you want to build 10, uh, it's impossible. You, don't, you are not going to find that, that place. So we invented this, this typology, if I can say, which is a stocket of pilot of different buildings, every of them with a lobby, uh, with a significant uh, space, and with a step back of the building in different uh, facades, uh, giving also a kind of outside space that can be like the garden, representative uh, garden of the, of the company. Um, this is the scheme of this uh, prototype, uh, this, this tower. You can see that in Panama, because the, the ground is so heavy and the, the sea is not heavy, it's really, uh, it's, it's mud, it's very bad quality, uh, and the sea is right there. Uh, it's impossible to go uh, deeper than a few meters. Uh, so every building has to provide a parking space for the people working in the building. That means that every skyscraper in Panama has these eight or 10 floors of parking. And the city has a strange landscape because the 10 first floors are nothing but urban, are completely mute uh, spaces. And the, I explain this because we will see something. So we were uh, in the in the organizing of, the, of this project, we got this uh, chapter of designing the uh, typology, of inventing the volume, uh, taking care of the general, um, the, the, the typical floor with the core and a structural uh, composition that could allow these different step backs uh, of the setbacks of the, of the tower going up. Um, and also the, the parking. Um, so um, we were working 
in this parking, it is a kind of the main lobby and the main uh, reception space in these buildings. Nothing related to the interior of the rest of the building. And of course, we designed also the, the facades in the idea that this random composition of the facade, first, it's, it's impossible to count the floors of the building. So uh, that's good when you have less floors than any other. <laughs> uh, but also to make visible these points, these accents where the tower is representing a kind of main space of every of these independent buildings. And also to uh, be able of integrating these uh, ventilations in the, in the garage floors uh, mimeticized with the, with the working space on the top floors, which is curiously the first time it was done there. It's the first time that the, the, the tower uh, in the parking floors really looks the same than in the rest of the building, more or less, no? and not like a parking without any other intention. I'm, I saw this fast because the elevation is working with these pixelized uh, glasses that is a composition looking for uh, um, environmental equilibrium in terms of solar energy incorporated to the, to the building. Uh, so we can manipulate the different elevations uh, uh, of, the <coughs> of the building, but also we can create this pixelized perception of the, of the environment that is not very uh, interesting when the, the buildings are quite close and more interesting when they are in the far. So from the outside, it's difficult to believe that every of those pieces is glass, but the ventilations of the garages. Here you can see these garages creating an urban uh, spirit and urban presence of this tower in the, in the night. And this is something that I, I really love. You see, this is the credit card of Ignacio Mayol, perhaps you know. Um, so this is the moment in which you design a tower for a bank, and the bank put your building in the credit card. Okay. So, really uh, interesting that um, the building, the idea of the building can really be incorporated like a communication instrument or like a corporate image. This has happened many times in history, of course, but uh, I think that today these two items are really more and more important in, in, in our uh, society and our, our culture, and we have to take it seriously. The, oh, ah, okay. the third architect is this architect as mediator. That means that we don't have the power, or we don't have all the power, like usually we had in the past, or uh, we, perhaps we have, hadn't, but we complained a lot for, for, for not having, having it. But now we can not have the power and be happy anyway. <laughs> Uh, we won this competition to, to, to build the Munch Museum in Oslo. It was a, a super uh, hard fighted competition. Uh, it was uh, 20 offices invited uh, around the world after a very hard uh, selection process. And we won with this building. You, you see where the, the opera of Esnoheta is and you know, here and the uh, Munch Museum. That we, we solved it with this uh, vertical museum that was uh, good to win the competition, but uh, not very well received by certain groups of uh, opinion of the city. And we had to start a complicated process of mediation uh, for this topic and for many others. I'm going to show very fast. <coughs> oh, this is just... Uh, better view and this is the the building at this is from the competition uh, image and um, I'm going to show only documents of this building done with the intention of establishing conversations or uh, open dialogues or answer questions or concerns that we receive it from many different uh, points. No? This is a diagram you don't read it very well um, 
of the people involved in the project. This is one of the diagrams we had to prepare to explain how complex one project like this is today, where uh, the architect is not in the center. I have shown here this diagram a couple of times. The architect is in the, in the right, you know, perhaps sometimes have to go to the center, but not all the time. The client has a very prominent uh, situation or, or position. Uh, and the consultants and the technicians and the experts and the local office we, we work with, LPO, uh, have a, a quite important uh, role in the project. So this is also uh, to explain how today the projects we do um, are the result of the selection of a collection, incredibly big collection of different inputs of information, you know, bits of information that all these people give to us, and how you select them and reorganize. That is the project, the contemporary architectural project. But it's quite important also to, to explain to people that all of these names are involved there. So it, this is not an architect trying to, to sell uh, like a one person obsession. It's more the result of all these conversations. This was our first argument to explain how if the building was uh, vertical or any other uh, concern, um, we had people enough to discuss that and to offer solutions or to change uh, the project in one moment. No? You see, um, this project was based in four different... Um, I don't have yes, I have. No? No? You see these four points. One of them is participation and debate urban planning, sustainability, and program. Participation and, and debate is the one I want to refer in this description. So we started with this drawing explaining how important was, was, was a museum like Munch to create public space enough around it. So one of the reasons to be vertical was to not stand, expand in the site, that is a very tight uh, 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 space. And, and many of the competitors were using all the, all the ground. That means uh, that the museum was not really offering the citizens more than a building, and, and which is good for tourist, but, uh, tourism, but for perhaps for the citizens it's better to have all this space. The second was about this concept of creating a kind of vertical plaza, uh, connecting the lobby with the, with the top of the building, um, something that could be open in the, in the night, also when the museum is closed, and dividing completely the, the project in two parts, the dynamic part and the static part. The static part is the museum itself. It's a collection of rooms that uh, um, you have to enter, watch the, the uh, pieces of art, and go out and go to the next floor. That means that the rooms are only for people who are inside watching the, the, the paintings, um, not necessarily crossing because you want to go to the next or, or whatever. No? So this idea of creating a kind of public uh, infrastructure uh, superimposed to the museum program that you see two colors here. The two colors are because um, one of the problems uh, in this site, which is by the sea, uh, was to place all the services of the museum. You know that in a museum today, the services or the, or the non exhibition spaces is more, more than 50%. So our, our decision was to place that in between the exhibition galleries. So the people going up uh, in this kind of uh, collection of platforms also could understand that the restoration department, the administration department, the education department are there and they are huge and important. And there are 100 people working, not only to preserve a, a, a collection of paintings that are highly valuable for every Norwegian, because Munch is finally the most important artist in, in, in their history, is really, they are really working to make this like a condensator, a condensator of urban life and, and experiences. And the, the, the building, the, the, the museum, is for the people, you know, is mostly for the Norwegians or the people from Oslo, uh, more than for the tourists that are only uh, using, let's say, the, the galleries. No? So this is the first lobby we draw. This is the first dynamic part, and these are the galleries. No? We had also to explain about the height of the building 
and how the building was not that hate uh, and was actually trying to establish some conversations with other buildings. The buildings behind with these towers is an MD MBRDB project called the barcode that was at construction at that time. I think the people in the city didn't know exactly, had, had not realized what's coming. No? Uh, we also had to do these this drawings explaining how this building was related to other important buildings in, in, in town and how, for example, this is the other high-rise buildings, let's say high-rise, no? or vertical building, this 60, tall, 60 meters tall, uh, which is a town hall of Oslo, and, and, and it took 30 years to be built, also because the discussion of the, of the height of the, of the building. Uh, but one of the beautiful things is that from the top of the Munch Museum, you will see every level of seeing the, the, the town hall of the, of the building. This is the, the SAS Tower. Some of the, of the buildings are quite historical and others are quite modern. This SAS Tower is a hotel. On the top, there is a fancy bar. Uh, when it was built, was a big uh, um, contestation from the press and from the media about this high building in the middle of the city. And now one of the problems we had is that the view from the bar of one of the important medieval points here was blocked by our building. Uh, so we had to move it. No? So we did all these comparisons of uh, the high uh, rise buildings in, in the city uh, or vertical museums in the world or also how actually we were creating the starting point of a very important axis in town, engaging all the other museums existing and future. Uh, and we did hundreds of these models to explain why we were proposing this. But in every of these steps, something new arised or landed in the project, and something was changed. Apparently not that much because the shape uh, looks the same, but really the building itself changed a lot, or at least from our point of view as architects, we know where, no? especially in the interior, uh, the changes were uh, very, very important. This is because the views, no? this, is, uh, this is a kind of secret mountain no? it was the, when the, where the city was actually founded initially, and so we were competing with it. And, um, so this is the only floor plan I'm going to show to explain that also in the interior design, we had long, long conversations uh, with this um, organization, general organization of the, of, the, of the floor plans because they were very simple. Uh, but the, uh, we did a, a research about uh, uh, ideal size of uh, art rooms for museums and we discovered that 90% of the big exhibitions going around the world in, in, in itinerant uh, uh, programs, they, are, they, are, they ask for 900 square meters, more or less. No? That is 9,000 feet square feet. Um, with what, what means that it's better, still better, is to have 600 and 300, like the big room and the small, uh, the small space for small pieces or, or whatever. So that's because we divided the floor plan in these two rooms, and we place this course. I'm not describing the, the building, and it's not my intention. Um, the intention is to describe all these discussions. This is a discussion about the program. Uh, in the competition, you see the exhibition space that we offered and the services. First meeting, every person at the head of this department were asking for more. No? So the only area to take off was in the exhibition space. So that was the second museum we had. No? This was the exhibition space, and all of them were happy, but not the director, of course. <laughs> no? So uh, very hardly, we started to grow <laughs> again. And for that, we have to compress, we have to change the floor plans, we have to demonstrate that it was possible. But in this, in this process, many, many things changed. This is Munch uh, painting outside his house in the garden where we can see the very different formats you know, from five meters high to, to, to the tiny things. And that's because the size of the rooms, the height of the rooms was also a huge 
research and, and, and discussion, and not, not always done by, by uh, our, uh, ourselves, asked to do to other people. Uh, this is the relation between the exhibition space and the, and the no, this is the discussion about what the core elevators and um, services should have. This is one of the tons of papers. And this is the other part no, of, the, of the discussion, the media, uh, groups of opinion, uh, leaders of many, many, uh, from many um, different uh, sides of the society, um, and all these covers of the <laughs> press. Uh, I hope you don't uh, understand, Norwegian. Uh, <laughs> but this is the most I like. Uh, because if, if you do this in Spain, nobody has uh, a beautiful Sunday. Uh, this is in the Sunday newspaper. So um, if you don't know my name, you, you can't start. <laughs> <laughs> so that means, <laughs> and, and the, question, the question was uh, uh, something like, this guy will build the Monk Museum if the Heritage Department uh, led him to do no? uh, That means that uh, the director, or I don't know, the, the people in this newspaper, which, which, that is the most important newspaper in the country, was completely convinced that the people should know Juan here. You know? <laughs> if you do this in Spain, nobody knows. Uh, nobody, so. And this is a demonstration you know, about how today in many places, in many societies, especially in these super democratic countries where everybody has a voice, a voice that has to be attended, no? uh, this phenomenon are incredibly uh, viral and, and strong. This is a, the last of the communication uh, ingredients. This is a torch parade. Torch parades in the Scandinavian countries are a quite important uh, demonstration. They are never done for political reasons. They are only done for humanitarian uh, motives, something that everybody should agree, you know, like uh, against the war or against, I don't know, any uh, social uh, concern. It was the first time that a cultural uh, uh, concern was um, asked in one touch, touch parade. Um, you can see here well, some people from, for example, from different political parties in the, in the administration, that here they are, as individuals, uh, participating in this, in this torch parade. The torch parade ha have to be um, announced or started or convoked by, by an individual. In this case, was a, was a bass player of a rock band um, who is in some of the pictures. And many, many associations, they get the same groups, or another family of groups, uh, not the ones going against the building, but the ones going uh, with the building. This is, this is the guy. Um, came. This is Hetil from Sojeta. Perhaps you know this, this guy. And they participated and they, they asked the municipality and they walked from the, here from the town hall to the, to the site asking the building to be, the museum to be built because the politicians were you know, in kind of never ending uh, conversation. No? So the last um, chapter of the discussion is about the facade. We were looking for this kind of enigmatic, blurring presence of the building in the idea that the, the weather in, in, in Norway is cloudy, but it's also quite rich in, in, in different lights. Every hour is different. And Edward Munch uh, um, had this interesting attitude that he, ne he never painted landscapes from, no, he was, an, uh, was not a plein air artist, um, but, uh, but he used to, to, to paint landscapes in, in, in his garden, as you have seen before. So he said, I don't need to see the landscape, but I need to feel the cold. No? So he was painting outside to have this feeling of the weather killing him. No? In this case, he's painting his friend, uh, and he's in the same position, he's, he's having the same effort, he's, he's naked like, like, like him, not protected by the, you know, the, 
the heart or something, just to understand his, his, his pain or his effort. No? That because we always also try to do this building that is a permanent response to the weather conditions and ready to be stimulated by the sun, by the clouds, by the light, and also, as we will see in the night, transform a kind of lamp. This is a beautiful image. It's a pity that this web page is not working. I think from when Instagram appeared, uh, this kind of experiment uh, finished. You know? This is a web page where, uh, where registered from where the, the tourists in Oslo took the pictures. And, and so it's, it's like to redraw the map of the city uh, through the uh, places where the people are looking at. You know? So this is the Bigelands Park, historically the most important uh, touristical destination in, in, in Oslo. This is the center, the castle, the town hall. This is the main street where all the museums are. And this, and this is the, are the islands where all the other museums are too. And this is the Esnoheta building for the opera. So that means that in two years after being built, one single contemporary building uh, could attract as the same people than many other attractions, no? and it stopped it so we will not be able of knowing when the, op the Moon Commission appears here, what happens. No? But it's beautiful to, to understand how uh, architecture can really do something for only one city. Sometimes we hope that the Opera at Sydney or Bilbao or something like that, uh, we know it's possible, but it's really uh, attractive to, to see the, the representation of, of it. No? So I'll go fast now. The case study is, this is not the five, it's the four, of course. It's the architect by email, no visits. This is, some commissions are so small, uh, and they are so far, uh, you can't go. Uh, but you have to establish a system to work. In this case, this is Guangzhou in South Korea. Uh, this is the or original wall of the historical city. It's not existing anymore. Uh, the city tried to redraw the, the wall, uh, um, asking some architects, small commissions in, in different points to recreate this, this line. We had this uh, corner, a very important place, and very tiny too. Um, important because he, here was one of the important corners where the democratic uh, the, the fight to get democracy in, in, in South Korea uh, started. Um, always these things start in, uh, start in a small library or uh, library, no, book, bookstore or bookshop, so something like that. So we asked our correspondents there to, to send some drawings, the trees, to recognize the trees, the names of the trees, the quality of the, of the ground, some very specific uh, views, and with that, we say, okay, we are going to do a manifesto of contemporary architecture, if, if I can say like that. Uh, remembering do two favorite images, you know, that all we have in our, from our first years. Uh, one is this a primitive hood of uh, uh, Loyer, you know, the idea that the a primitive architecture, or the architecture really starts in the moment that architecture is not only to protect, to cover, to defend from the aggressive outside, in the moment that the architecture can be light enough to represent a kind of transitional object in between uh, the body and, the, and, and, and the, the, the world, the landscape, or whatever. So it's the introduction of the subjective perception uh, farther than the parameters of the <laughs> climate or, or the weather. The other image, oh, sorry, this is uh, related to the previous, this is already our project. This is the second image, <coughs> it's a, this is a Patagonia, it's a, it's a burned wooden house and once destroyed by the fire only remains the, the fireplace and the stone floor. This is also from a text, the, uh, A Home is Not a House, from Rainer Barnum, who said um, that the history of the house was the history of the construction of a weak um, hood around a solid stone fireplace 
and a solid thermal floor. So um, this idea, which is, uh, is, is in Patagonia, uh, illustrating one of the Porphyro uh, books, was the one we used saying, OK, what we want to do is something like this, working with the, working with the floor of, of, of this space and creating something like that fireplace that now will be conquering the, the, the air. And the idea is mm, remembering this uh, concept of the lawyer that apparently that hood was so weak that was not a private possession, no, was, was not a house exactly. So here was a, a manifesto about the uh, collective intimate space. And I use collective intimate and not public private. That is like, don't say anything. Um, but collective intimate means that today, the most public space, the most contemporary public space is there where every individual can really feel uh, an, an opportunity of express uh, his or her individuality. You know? So that was the idea and we we are sending all these uh, ideas to our Korean, uh, South Korean colleagues. I don't know what uh, they were thinking. Uh, sending these images about we want to incorporate the trees as part of the, of the design. We want to create some light uh, uh, on this lamp, but the light is also heat, it's also information, it's also music, it's also Wi Fi um, anthem. Perhaps today is not necessary the Wi Fi, but this is just a uh, three or four years ago were not, was, was not so uh, easy. So our drawings were very simple, like this, no? looking for the image. This is the opening night. He's, this guy is Paul Miller, DJ Spooky. Perhaps you know his music. Um, and the floor, uh, like in the Rainer Banham uh, idea, with some of these pieces going up, emerging, uh, not exactly with the, the shape of a bench. The heights were kind of strange, no? uh, lower than a bench, higher than a table. Uh, so the idea is that when you do something there, you are inventing how to use the place. So it finally, as you are seeing, was built and the people is using 24 hours. Oh, this is the day of the opening. This is a typical, you know, it's a, some people perhaps preparing a party or a botellón. Okay, this is the five, this is the last. Um, the architect has an expert coordinator, no idea. So the, the architect has no idea about many of the chapters uh, of our projects, but we, we know how to talk about them. We know how to ask for uh, help, and we know how to to listen. So this is a, a huge project. This is the uh, Bogota uh, Congress Center. It's 75,000 square meters. It was also an international competition. We won this competition with a very simple concept. The idea was um, every Congress Center has a lobby. The lobby is uh, like a um, closed space where registration and, and all these uh, rituals of the Congress are done. So it's, it's not part of the city. And because the place we were, and not to, to not, not block the connection between different uh, neighbors, we said this is, an, this is a plaza, this is a square, and we will have all these small lobbies in front of every door of every room. We have rooms in this place for five to 5,000 people. Uh, and, 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 and the spiral movement uh, tells you where to go and very easy to understand the, the uh, composition and the way of using the building. No? Uh, one of the first decisions, this is the scheme, this is all these people working, the experts I mentioned before are all of them here. I don't want to lose more time here. One of the first decisions in this project was redefine the typology, say, okay, this is a Congress Center, but we are not going to do any auditorium. That was a shock. Uh, we said, okay, we want 
flat rooms from 25 to 5,000 square meters uh, where everything can happen. You can extend, join, divide them. Uh, the auditorium part, especially if the, if, the, if the event is a congress, is really easy to install. No? Um, and it's stupid to don't be able of presenting a new car or doing a techno session, uh, no, techno music session uh, one Friday in the night. You have a parking with 3,000 cars, no? so it's the best place in town to do that kind of thing. So you can do a, uh, some festivals, so you can do a f fair of uh, flowers or, I don't know, yo -yo, or, or antiquities or whatever, because you, you have the sloped um, um, auditorium, typical functional, say. so everything is going to be flat. The second uh, was more um, complicated to convince, was say, because the weather of in, in, in Bogota, we, we are not in extreme uh, temperatures, where Bogota is from 7 to 27 degrees, more or less, so it's perfect to don't have any air conditioned machine. So uh, we will try to work only moving air in a natural way and to create a kind of passive building, but completely reactive is the like the monk being being reactive uh, towards uh, uh, the environmental situation in this case was the building uh, being the building manipulating the building no some people will be changing opening some uh, doors and, 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 and creating this movement of the air to ventilate this is the, one of the drawings we prepare as architects uh, and what is interesting in this in this discussion is uh, we had local uh, experts and international experts. No? The international experts were saying, okay, it works, but we are going to put some machines in the corners. <laughs> no? uh, perhaps they are, were uh, being afraid of having some problems. The local were absolutely resistant. They really was convinced that they could do that and they could be, could be the heroes of uh, his town. So they were not afraid about that. But what is important is to discover that the first answer of this expert was, if you want to do that, every floor will, have, will need to have three meters deep. No? So we said, mm, we have been fighting all our life to have thin, fla, fla, uh, thin floors, uh, thin, thin slabs. No? Uh, but the structural team present in the conversations said, OK, with three meters, I can do everything. No? So finally, we accepted that some of these extreme conditions create aesthetic consequences in the buildings. Now, one of the questions is the sustainable culture is that we are now today doing every day bigger and bigger uh, carpent carpenters uh, for our windows. No? We have been 100 years trying to do them not slim, <laughs> and now we are doing it. So this is the apparition of these spaces that are really big, and a lot of things can happen there. No? So the, we have. It's, it's, they are so big and so important that we have to draw the floor plans of the interior of these uh, spaces. No? Uh, these are mm, beautiful schemes explaining the movement of the air and the, the bar variation of the temperature from 7 in the morning uh, and uh, along the day and exhausting the air on the top. So, and every room was studied with the help of the, this is OVR uh, systems. And finally, we could create also one of the conclusions was that we could really save tons of energy um, and, and, uh, and to do a cheaper building if we reduced the activities in the facade that had to be directly connected with the outside, especially in the south and the west, like everywhere, no? everywhere in not half of the world. No? Um, but um, so that really is a strong uh, uh, ask, no? Because that means that you have to place, for example, the technical corridors or the service corridors in the facade, because they are going to be always service corridors, and so you can accept some uh, less quality or five more degrees in the air, etc. But the consequence of that is that. Finally, we, we placed in all the perimeter of the building, the, the activities we placed, or the, 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 um, the different parts of the program, are going to be fixed, hopefully, 
No, the kitchens will be always kitchens, the warehouses will be warehouses, the corridors will be corridors, because the flexible part, the rooms, is inside. So perhaps not with a typical uh, connection with the natural light. And we did all these families of mullions and different glasses uh, to place only the expensive ones in certain points, and also to uh, understand that many of these classes, 40% of them, can be single glasses. So it's better that they are single than double. So um, all this relation that the, the building can be heated during the day, but in the night, it has to be cold again. And if you put a double glass, you, it's, it's like a jail for this air, and the air never goes out. No? So we need the night to start from zero again. That means that the, the glasses are really uh, single. No, I'm not going to go on this. But this is the reason of this diversity. I'm apparently random, uh, but you identify some of these slabs. And this is, for example, rooms that are closer to the facade than these ones. That is the technical or the lobby parts. No? And this is the same argument, but for the installation in the city. Uh, I have a video. I had a video for the Oslo Museum. I have forgotten. It's okay. It was wonderful. Um, <laughs> but I have a video for the for this. We, we can see this. And can we? Yes. It's important to say that this video and the video of Oslo are videos done with, um, not with architectural intentions. So I'm not in love with, with it. No? Uh, it's absolutely something done after the design process. Um, and every lecture I give, somebody asks me, who, do, do you do the videos at home or at, uh, do your office or whatever? So these videos are uh, really directed by us by, with the intention of uh, help our clients to promote the building. So uh, I think it's interesting to, to say that because we have this uh, over presence of renders and videos and animations. And, and sometimes we don't understand uh, why we do or for what we do them, no? we, we, we made them. So the understanding that we don't need uh, the renders uh, for us. We don't need to discover something that we can't see in, in the drawings we do because we know that language, but we need them to transmit to others, change absolutely uh, the, the image because you identify many times how many architects make the, those renders, but they are not making them to, to explain to others, uh, really, uh, or, or they, are, they are not understandable renders for others. They are in a kind of private language for architects, uh, which is a unuseful uh, work, no? So this part is, no, this part of the explanation of the circulations is, is going in that direction, is to explain people who as very difficult for them to understand the drawings or the sections, no? So this is a promotional piece, no?
So what we have seen in, the, in these five types of architects is the incorporation of social, economic, environmental ingredients in the, in the design process. I think that this is a great opportunity to give back architecture and an important role in the construction of the present and the future because perhaps, at least I have the feeling that architecture is a little bit out of the forces that really shape the world today. You know? We are quite confident in architecture, our private architectural world, but I'm not sure that the world outside is, 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 is confident on, on that. No? That's because I think it's so important to be critical, radical, and experimental. But I think it's, it's necessary to be these three, these three things to identify what is important, what has value, and what has not. I think that's one of the most differ, difficult things, no? to identify what is important to do, or where, what is important to get. No? And finally, I think the idea of dialogue uh, is absolutely against any effort to impose the others our point of view. The dialogue is also against the overvaluation of uh, being misunderstanding, of being the hero uh, not understand, understood uh, uh, of the world, no? uh, from the solitude of our wonderful uh, ideas. I think that dialogue is the way of going out and, and, and try to demonstrate that what we, what we have, what architecture has for everybody, because finally, architecture is for the people, it's for everybody in the city or in their, in their houses. Um, that's all. Thank you very much. Well, Juan, uh, thank you very much for that uh, smart and beautiful and inspiring work and, uh, and ideas. And I wanted to um, just start by asking you about um, this, this new model uh, of architecture that you're suggesting. And specifically, I'm fascinated by um, your observation that uh, maybe now there's a new breed of small global practices um, that can compete with these large international firms. Um, and I guess I wanted to, to ask you a little more about that and ask you, I guess, first, um, what do you think are some of the capacities and techniques that allow a, a small global firm to compete? But then also, um, do you think this is kind of a phase change? Um, and uh, if so, will it lead to a kind of more inclusive and diverse uh, set of practices? Or is it really just a kind of substitution? Is it just swapping you know, small, nimble firms and a small set of them for large, uh, bloated firms mm -hmm. and a small set of them? I mean, will it, will it just be a kind of a different mode of practice, but a, a similar uh, set mm. of characters? Uh, okay, if I forget something, you remember me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think um, that um, the, the process uh, that the global practice has had in the last 20 years no? or 30 years um, starts when the crisis in, in, in Europe and, 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 and US, uh, the economic crisis obliged big companies who at that time were doing completely obsolete uh, uh, architecture in terms of uh, um, skyscrapers, uh, very banal uh, uh, consumer architecture. Um, but they, 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 they had these models developed and they could export to many other emerging uh, economies 
without any reflection about they can tra no, transporting this. I don't call this global architecture. I think that's like international architecture or sport architecture, uh, which is different. I think that the second step is when big offices with a strong capability of working uh, start to go out and to build a big monument of these this emerging economies, mm, which is a quite positive and, 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 and strong moment. But also, there is one moment that we feel that they are too big and, and, and they have to get many commissions and they have to, to, to keep the, you know, the, the machine. Uh, and also, there is a kind of repetition and there is a kind of lack of sensibility towards the places they are working. At the same time, uh, these uh, smaller offices uh, with this flexibility uh, start to work, and, and today we can see how many international competitions are won by small size offices against really big ones. No? And I think the, the reason is because this type of conversations that every Every architect with some knowledge, with, uh, with some experience, uh, but only a little one, um, can establish these conversations with other people who really know uh, how to do many things. No? So we have to substitute the experience of the architect who has done many times the same thing by these architects that who, who can do many different things in the time because they only have to call the right persons, the right people to join their teams. No? And, 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 and I think that's quite uh, interesting and, and, and something should be researched about, no? uh, this, the size and, and, and of these offices and the penetration they have. And I think they are global because they are working in a global attitude. And that means that it's not different to work at home that to work far. Uh, so the global way of thinking means that you have the whole world in your head and it's not a problem where you're doing that. You, you display the same sensibility and, 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 and you can really create uh, something not exactly local but understood as by locals as their own. One of the, of course, why Oslo? has created us all these uh, small nightmares of conversations and, 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 and debates because they have a very strong proudness. You know, there's the more important artists and in the center of the, of the most important city and somebody from outside is coming. You know? So you have to convince or you have to explain, transmit the idea that you are there to build the most Norwegian building, that they, when, when you finish, you go, and, and, and the building is for them, and they are going to identify it as, a, as, as a, their own building. One, one interesting thing is that the discussions took too long, so long, that that time was needed to let the people appreciate the building like, you know? so. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so this idea of, of discussion and dialogue, you know, that you're, um, talking about in your practice is is that related to some of your recent thinking about education? In other words, you know, you you recently, um, as the new director of Advanced Studios, created a new weekly series of mm -hmm. discussions called the Transfer Dialogues. Could we see that as as a a version of you thinking that we should help prepare you know <laughs> students to to operate in in this new way? Yes, yeah. um, I think we're. The architects um, who are also practitioners, um, I think we don't teach as we do if we were not practitioners, and we did, we didn't we, we, we would, wouldn't practice as we do if we were not uh, teaching. No, so I think you know, the teaching them. Environment is like the laboratory of, of what you do in the real life, but the real life is also the laboratory of what you do in the school. And, and I'm not uh, agree with uh, 
education uh, theories who try to make the schools as similar to reality as possible. I think the school is an experimental space and, and reality is really another completely different thing. No? But it's important to convince the students that they will be, they were ready to do that and they are prepared to, 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 to affront it. And, and also in my case that I teach, I have been teaching for 30 years in the public school and, 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 and Columbia, Princeton, IIT, many places. And this also this confrontation between these two very different environments, so a very, very local one like Madrid is, and the uh, global uh, like uh, Colombia, um, is for me uh, also a kind of conversation at, at these levels. No? And I think it's really important. No? Perhaps I think this years ago, every student asked you for a letter uh, the last day of class to go to a huge, big, wonderful office. And now they are asking the letters to go to offices of 10 people, no? Mm -hmm. I think that's also important no? or interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about something slightly different, and it's uh, about whether you have a, a, a kind of specific take on sustainability. Um, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have a, I, I have a few, uh, data points for, for some of my understanding of your take on sustainability. One of them is, is your kind of upending of the traditional understanding, or recent understanding of sustainability that we might need, you know, this double paned or triple paned glass and you're actually saying we can use single paned glass that maybe we don't need to treat these boxes of buildings as totally sealed. There might be something about it being more open and flowing um, so but, but I see that as a kind of a way of you um, critiquing maybe you know the, the traditional <laughs> logic of sustainability um, you know I've also um, heard you uh, uh, talk about being interested in blurring the lines between natural and artificial um, so maybe that's mm -hmm. related to sustainability and third um, I think I, if I have this right uh, I've heard you kind of critique a, a, a set of designs um, that is arguing for itself that it's so sustainable that it almost doesn't have to consider design. And so, <laughs> so I've heard you argue we need to kind of take back, um, you know, design uh, into the equation from this, you know, mandate about sustainability. I'm not sure if all of those are exactly correct, but do you have like hmm. a, you know, a certain um, take on sustainability at this point or uh, observations about it? Yeah, the, the, um, the, the, the question I, I, I think is, is important uh, when we confront with all these topics and uh, I try also to transmit in my uh, pedagogic activity is always what is, why this is interesting for us, no? beyond the concern or beyond the social responsibility or beyond our environmental sensibility. <clears throat> what is interesting for architects, no? can we really find something new working with these uh, new sensibilities that can be incorporated to our project, uh, that, that we incorporated to our, our practice? Um, we could say um, sustainability is uh, so uh, it's a great agreement. Uh, you know, everybody is uh, concerned uh, uh, on that. So, of course, we can be critical on the way it's used. Uh, we can be critical in the uh, super weak and banal uh, understanding that many people have uh, about. But we could say if we work in that uh, b beta, no, uh, we will we will have an opportunity of opening this penetration of architecture so far. So we can be critical. Uh, it's good because we have places to be critical, and we have our own in critical environment. But when we go out, we have to be very serious about that. No, the the blurring of the natural and artificial is is, is part of this critical part. No, is. We are not very interested on in using natural elements. We, are, we don't think that the sustainability, the sustainable sensibility of the blurring of the natural artificial means to uh, put green everywhere in every facade, or in every, you know. Uh, but to understand that uh, the artificial condition of architecture and the artificial condition of the city can be understood like a collection of natural processes, so a, a, a superimposition of processes like nature. Does no so that's the the idea of nature. Mm. I'm more um, interested, and 
Of course, I, I think that for the last part of your question, this um, position uh, towards sustainability is, is, is very delicate because it's one of those worlds completely divided in sceptics and fanatics. No? So uh, how to place in the middle in between these two worlds and learning to talk with both of them, and is that, that's the difficult part, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted to ask one more question, and then I'll, uh, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience. But, um, you know, I, I couldn't help um, logging uh, the no's in each of, your, uh, each of your case studies. So, you know, we had no working drawings, no total control, no power, no visits, no idea. You know, you also gave some other ones, like no, no heroes. We <laughs> no heroes. Maybe like no, no double pane glass, um, or only 40%, I guess. Um, yeah. But uh, I mean, I, I don't know if this is a fair question, but so what are we left with? Or do you have thoughts? Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe I should leave it at that. But you know, do we have thoughts like, so by extension, can we say, observing in your, your projects that you showed tonight, um, you know, that, that we, do we have some yeses? We have like yes to creating a new kind of manifesto, yes to creating a thermal slab, yes to designing mm -hmm. the airflow. I mean, some of, to see your drawings, we might think, well, that's, that's maybe one of the new ways of designing is designing the airflow in the walls or something yeah. to control the air. I mean, do mm. you, are you kind of thinking in those terms that there are some, some new opportunities within the nose? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think there are, there are two different moments, um, or three, you know. One is um, how you choose uh, the works you want to do. Uh, in, in, mm -hmm. in the case of, of my office, we really uh, work very hard selecting what we want to do, uh, what competitions are we looking for, what kind of opportunities we, are, we want. Uh, we ask ourselves always, what is this uh, commission useful for us? No? So you decide to work in some of these directions. So you decide, okay, we're going to invent a new type or whatever. No? The second is what you do. And the third is how you describe. No? So uh, I, I, I can confess no, that description is a re-description of the project and it's a description of the position. Perhaps I, not, I was not thinking on being a designer of prototypes when I was doing this small house. No? So, but when you, you have finished, you, you can say, okay, I can use this to transmit one idea. Or you, you, create, the, you create the concept after doing it. No? So there is not so linear, and I think this is important. This is, this is part of the practices like us. Right? We, we do very small and fast things, medium size and two big things, not, no more than that. No? And, Today I was, I was thinking on this uh, last, I think it's the last book of Simon Reynolds, the, the music uh, critic, uh, that f at the end of the book uh, he says uh, there is a heavy nostalgia of the big bands, no? the big rock bands, that is obvious that never will come back. Uh, so we have to understand that the world will be defined, but this is a small experiment of techno-music uh, people, mm. perhaps people without name or with, with a very short life because they are jumping one, what, what, one band to another and one group to another, different experiments, different countries, you know, or to Ibiza or to, or to LA or whatever, and they are creating a kind of permanent <coughs> noise done of very small things, and that's the music today, you know? So that's because I, I have said many times that architects are not uh, orchestra conductors, they are more like DJs, you know, taking all these fragments of the present. So I think that that is, uh, that is the, the point, you know? And when we work in, in our office, we are having these conversations in parallel with a completely real and, and everyday work. We are not we can't uh, transform everything we do in an statement, no? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's a, I think, an interest, it's an intellectual work parallel to the absolutely pragmatic everyday activity, no? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if I have thoughts, sorry. No, that's, that's very interesting. Um, 
Let's open it up to a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Are there questions? Uh, thank you, Juan. I think that the array of projects and attitude and potential openings for conversations in this typology of architects, I think it's very provocative. I would just ask you one maybe very banal question, picking up on what you said at the very end. Uh, how did you choose, decide, or maybe compose the music of the first video? Ah, <laughs> it's a Paul Branca uh, composition. I hope he's not in the audience. <laughs> the, 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 the one with the house. The house, yes. It's a, it's a symphony number five of Paul Branca. Beautiful. So we... we, we we took it and we played. Is that the question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Yes. And speaking of a global practice, I'm curious how you position yourself and how you see your work in that way, like building yourself up? How do you, for example, get these projects? Are they competitions? Are they invited in some way? How we choose our work is the question? Yeah, and how you position okay, okay. yourself, okay. being in between academics and pure practice. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we have a um, limited capability of work um, because we have uh, size of the office, never more than 20 people. Um, we have to, we, we try to have, it's part of our agenda, small uh, projects permanently, uh, those projects that many people think that we don't take, medium-sized ones and big ones. We need the small ones too, uh, use them as laboratories of the big ones. So we try in these small projects, many of the experiments we are going to do in, in other projects. But also we use them to have every few months something new uh, just to make easier the big effort that means to do these huge complicated projects. No? Uh, these small projects, we look for them uh, in, in art world or you know, some, no, no, not the Korea, for example, is the is a particular case of something small, dumb, quite far from, from our office. The rest usually are close and we look in our neighbors, no? uh, in our proximity. Um, the middle size and the big uh, size usually come by competition. Uh, I think 80% um, of, of our work is, is from international competitions. So from international competitions, even in Spain, so competitions where foreign architects are invited in Spain to do things, and also outside. So we enter these competitions with uh, first phase to be shortlisted or sometimes we are invited to, to do. The short list competitions means that you select the competition you would like to be selected, and we dedicate practically all our efforts to be selected in these competitions where, which we want to take part. And we are not selected many times, but we get it sometimes, and a very few, few of them we win. And we only need to win one of these every year so it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi. 
Um, so I, I find it very interesting the way that you uh, set out the sort of uh, typology of, of what architects are. Uh, but if, like as David mentioned, it seems like there are a lot of, or it seems to be framed more as what architects are not. Um, and so it, uh, you know, it, I'm very curious about uh, how do you think that the the definition of what an architect is has um, eroded enough that we could say that to, that architects are no longer uh, really a thing, and that and that maybe uh, as uh, Doug Pratt or or Kanye West might say that it's that to architect is, is has become more of a verb than than a noun. That it seems to be more about um, understanding and and coordinating all these different uh, uh, processes, and not so much about uh, the uh, the architect as this uh, as this thing as this creative uh, force, so to say. Um, can you repeat very yeah, summarized? Yeah. I'm not I'm not seeing you, so I sure. Yeah. So uh, so I guess it seems like the architect as a noun maybe has sort of eroded in its definition. Uh, your typology is sort of taking things that have traditionally been considered uh, the architect's role and sort of turn them on its head. So it seems like architecture or the architect is no longer perhaps a noun, that maybe it's a verb, and that uh, you've sort of uh, defined it more in terms of what, ar uh, what architects no longer do and what they and expanded the, uh, the role of architecture. I, I guess that's not really a question. But okay. so, so what is, uh, is architecture more of a verb now? Or is, is What's it architect more? <laughs> Uh, would you say that arch that architects are more about uh, about the, the 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 verb, the uh, the the different roles that they're able to take yeah. on and uh, and coordinate, rather than the uh, specific uh, architect as a, okay. as a singular person or as an yeah. as the noun? Well, I one of the of the things to point is I'm not. I don't think I'm saying something very new with this. It's just to redescribe the practice with another word, because I think architects have done all this I have mentioned before for many years. But the, uh, I think that the obsession of the Unitarian work and the linear practice and the having a style to be recognized um, has been so, so hard avoiding the architects to play more different melodies and to, to take part of more different um, groups of work and, 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 and definitely to be less well-defined, as, no, as, as you are mentioning. Um, there is a kind of provocation uh, to be said uh, here, but um, we admire and we love architects in the 20th century who, with a few materials for his or her entire life, with a few typologies, with a collection of small and medium-sized buildings, most of them commissioned by the phone, you know, in their around their own cities, they could create an incredible uh, body of work, and we really perhaps would love to have that. No, but that today is impossible. So um, without forgetting our admiration uh, for those big names. No? We have to reinvent this practice because I think in the next future, the offices of uh, young architects like you will do many different tasks and not a significant part of them perhaps will be commissions of design buildings to be built. So taking part of uh, groups of work, establishing the conditions for let something happening, perhaps to let the other architect to come to design something, advising, uh, designing, editing, publishing, teaching. No? So the idea, the main idea is that everything we do is a project. And if we understand that it's a project 
to, um, to teach, uh, and it's a project to run a magazine, and it's a project to curate something, and not, no, that's a good reason why many people, we were talking about this no, last Friday here in this table, many people in many different fields use the word project to describe something that, that, that that is taken directly from the architectural world. No? When an artist say, I have a project, no? we understand perfectly what he wants to say. No? So um, I think that we will have many projects, and many of the projects we will have to invent them, and many of the projects will be completely different. No? So perhaps I, I have shown these five examples. I think that an architect, a solid architect, 20 years ago, would say, no, I'm not going to do an industrialized house if I can't draw, I'm talking in the European context, I can't do till the last screw. I'm not going to accept a commission where I'm going to do the volume, the facade, the garage, but not the interior or not the distribution. No? I'm not going to accept a, a, a project if I can't go every 10 days to visit the construction and you pay me the flight. No? So, but, but today, uh, we are not, that's not means, doesn't mean that we are transforming into architects of fortune or something like that. Is that we can find opportun experimental opportunities in those situations, in those strange situations, because one of the most important experimental uh, works in every laboratory in the world is to eliminate a part of the body, you know, of any body, you know, and, and to, to know what happens, how the rest of the body reacts. You know? So we have these options today. You know? We can take part in and complete bodies you know, to understand how the rest of the body works. You know? And these huge teams where we, are, we take part with a small office, you know, and most of the teams in these diagrams are really bigger than us, you know? they, 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 they let us to understand how decisions are taken. And, and we also can understand how irrational many of these things are, or how super low pragmatic engineers are, or you know, these beautiful conclusions you know, that can really open many doors to uh, creativity and, and fantasy and, and diversity. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, in that sense, it's very uh, it's a very optimistic uh, approach in the in the context of this you know rapidly changing yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. The world is uh, ugly enough no, to, <laughs> <laughs> to not be optimistic. No? If we are not optimistic, optimistic uh, we will be harassed no, by <laughs> reality. But yes, I think it's, it's uh, also from the architectural field, I think now we can be more optimistic in all these crises and economical recessions or whatever, be more optimistic in terms of what architecture can do now for the for the future than uh, a time ago where architecture were only thinking on making buildings one by one, you know? and a good collection of buildings inserted in an ugly magma called city. You know? I think today we are doing anything else than diamonds uh, and we are all have opened uh, a lot of conversations about many other things, and the buildings really come to this conversation to have a wonderful role. I think that the, the uh, I don't know, when, when, I, when I started working, I had the feeling that the whole system had thought, okay, we will give the architects the buildings, no? Because the buildings are coming always the last. No? So they are not going to plan the future of the city. They are not going to take political decisions. They are not going to create the big concerns of the society. But they will come at the last moment to do the buildings. No? I think that now many people are fighting to be in the, in the, in the front. No? I'm not obsessed uh, with making the buildings. Some of the buildings will be done by good architects and some not. But perhaps we will have, again, to have good cities with not incredible buildings, more than horrible cities with a few nice buildings. No? I think that's better. <laughs> OK. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question. Yeah. Uh, Professor Herreros, um, 
you mentioned something about your commission in the Bank of Panama, right? Yeah. Um, you say that the client uh, wanted something corporative. So how, how, do, how do you deal with that when you have this idea of corporation? You know, society has an, an idea of corporation. Mm -hmm. You have that idea. So how do you deal with that, maybe with that language? And how do you know you get to that? To that um, mm -hmm. um, I mean, what the client wants. In that way. Yeah. Um, I think that the, the only, I don't say how to say virtud in English, but the, the only virtud exists. No? So, okay. The only virtud in general is generosity. So when one client asks you for that, you can uh, have a negative reaction like, uh, no, this is a corporate uh, expression of something, or this is, uh, but also you can turn the question to the you know, back and say, okay, this is something for the city. You know? So when somebody really asks you to create a, a kind of singularity, or you know, of course, you know, you can interpret what he's looking for. And perhaps it's not exactly your most uh, no, important value, or, you know, the value that you understand like the most important. But you can transform that into the opportunity to create a place to the people work uh, in an interesting way, or just to uh, incorporate this piece to the landscape of the city and to mm, operate with the uh, with, uh, with image uh, in an experimental way and, and, and learn something about how we read these pieces from the fire or from the clothes. No, I could, I could talk a lot about how we decided many of these, uh, no, apparently not very complicated random, but this, there is a highway going to the airport, go passing in front of the building, so it's important that you see the building and how you are approaching it. So many of these things are part of our um, secret you could say secret experimental opportunities taken in any of these commissions. So, and to answer this question, I could say every project or every task or every building uh, all of us design has three lives. No? One is the life, the relation with your client. No? So you have to do the best for your client and he has to be happy. That's one. No? The second is what role that building plays in your career. No? So you have to, to see yourself and say, okay, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to, this is going to be here. No? No? This is going to add something to this line. No? And the other is how through that piece you are going to establish this conversation with the world of architecture. No? That doesn't mean that you are, have a podium or you are in a prominent position. You can be at your home silently, but you are, through this intellectual projection, you are contributing in some way to the creation of these general uh, statements. No? Um, and I think that that's also an, an important part. No? So um, in, in that's those three relations, if you only concentrate in what the person that you have in front of you is asking you, perhaps many, many times you will say, oh, this, this is so boring, or this is so weak, or this is so banal. No? But you say, okay, uh, this is banal, perhaps, but I'm going to use for something that is going to be useful for me, for my students, for my colleagues, so, et cetera. No? That's the way of thinking, I think, to be optimistic. Yeah. Well, I think that's, um, that's fitting of your work to give us um, a kind of conclusion that is both very clear uh, and very open-ended. So thank you, Juan. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.